Majoritarianism, if you go dictionary meaning, it basically means that country is run by the wishes of the majority without taking into consideration the minority. Now, what happens? There are social theories, western social theories and they feel that majority always, always oppresses the minority. So, therefore, the minority, they call it structural violence and other names, but the idea is majority, minority is always, always oppressed. So, if the country is run by the wishes of the majority, that is a problem by itself, regardless of whether any problem is there or not. Namaste all the Sangam Talks viewers. Welcome to today's session. Today we have Kaushik Gangopadhyay ji with us. He is an accomplished economist holding a PhD from the University of Rochester in 2007 and currently serving as a professor at the Indian Institute of Management, Koji Kode, with a strong publication record in prestigious international journals and experience in co-editing a book with Springer Velrag. Kaushik ji brings a wealth of expertise to his work. Outside academia, he is known for his insightful articles in popular outlets like DNA, First Post, Swaraj, and Matrabhumi. His latest book, The Majoritarian Myth, How Unscientific Social Theories Create This Harmony, is our discussion topic for today. It challenges conventional perspectives on societal dynamics, offering a fresh take rooted in empirical evidence and rigorous analysis. In this book, Kaushik ji brilliantly breaks the myth that majoritarianism is the cause and driver of ill tolerance in society. The commonest analogy that he has used is that of people blaming the driver of a bigger vehicle in any accident without doing any rational analysis of the true situation. Welcome again Kaushik ji. Welcome to this session today. Namaste, uh, Namaste Akshay ji for having me here. And namaste to all the listeners and all the well wishers of the Sangram Talks. So, Kaushiki, my first question is about your subtitle from your book. It talks about disharmony in society, and you also argue that Western social theories, rather than Hindu nationalism or Hindutva, that are that is responsible for societal disharmony in India. That is, Western social theories are responsible. Can you elaborate on how these theories? contribute to polarization and discord in society? Very interesting question. Uh, you know what? Most of the people around me in my workplace and uh, society I live in, uh, they are liberals. So what happens is that they often bring up this topic of polarization in India. And eventually uh, the conclusion comes very, very quickly, simply, uh, drastically. It is the Hindu nationalism, Hindutva that is responsible for all the polarization in India. Uh, usually the, you know, it, mm, the topic goes to some other direction. Uh, now the thing is I take their talk very, very seriously. I just do not take it as, an, as a gossip or kind of as a, uh, as a proposition to be acknowledged and nodded. Now let us take it really seriously. If really Hindutva is doing all this polarization in India, then if there is no Hindutva, there would not be any polarization, right? That is how the cause and effect works in a science. Now, if you go to America, right, where is Hindu nationalism? Yeah? Now, but if you look at the polarization in India, America, it is way, way bigger than what is the situation in India. It is a much more homogeneous country than in India. But if you look at the polarization in America, uh, it is, so there are two studies I have quoted in my book. One study is a long-term study. It spans actually four or five decades from 1970s onwards till today. It is done by, not today, it is like it ends I think 2017 or 18. It was done by economists from very reputed schools, Stanford and uh, uh, Cornell if I remember correctly. Uh, and there they have shown the basically polarization in America sharply went up and the cause is political only. That is where it stops at, right? And we all know that from 1970s onwards, the tenets of modern liberal, left liberalism, that is called liberalism generally, they are taught in American universities and other places. And also, if you look at this Wall Street Journal, they have done a kind of a survey, 2000 compared to 2019 and 2023, four years. Before, 80 percent people used to say that tolerance for other opinions is very important. Now that number from 80 percent, it has fallen to 
58 percent, right? Big fall when the high priests of liberalism are in power in America. So, definitely America is polarizing. What is the explanation? The Hindutto, Hindutto accusers will give us. Now, well, they might say, well, all you know, this is a problem of religious fanaticism. America, there is a Christian uh, fundamentalist. No, first and foremost, Christian fundamentalist, if anything, they are going down, not going up. But let us take them, I, I mean, I give them a chance, ok. If Christian fundamentalists are the problem, ok, let us go to another country where there is neither Hindu nationalist nor Christian fundamentalist, and that country is Netherlands. It is a most of the people, I think more than half of the people in uh, Netherlands, they do not uh, call themselves belonging to any religion. So, more than half are atheists. And in Netherlands also polarization is drastically going up. So, there is a leader who is called uh, thought to be political paria, his name is Hirth Wilders. He actually got uh, uh, major, I mean uh, he won the mo maximum amount of seats in the parliament there, right. So, again big polarization happening there and then uh, well, how would you then explain it? But I can see one thing, all these three countries, India, America, Netherlands, it is the liberal ideas that are taught in every educational institution and that I mean this is a simple conclusion is let us examine their ideas. Are they really doing social harmony or not? And that is what exactly I have done. I have taken up one of their ideas and discussed in my book. So, Kaushikji, my next question is again from your book, you discuss majoritarianism as a concept. Could you explain what majoritarianism is according to you and why do you believe it is problematic and also another question linked to it, what role does global media coverage play in perpetuating this myth against India or Hindus in India? Okay. Um, now, of course, it is a very, very important question um, to answer. So, first let us understand what is majoritarianism. So, majoritarianism if you go dictionary meaning it basically means that country is run by the wishes of the majority without taking into consideration the minority. Now, what happens there are social theories western social theories and they feel that majority always always oppresses the minority. So, therefore, the minority they call it structural violence and other names, but the idea is majority, minority is always always oppressed. So, if the country is run by the wishes of the majority that is a problem by itself regardless of whether any problem is there or not. Now, I will give you an example 7th October last year 2023 there is a big strike against uh, Israel. Uh, by the Hamas terrorists, right? We are all aware of many hundreds of people, uh, maybe 1500 or so people died, and there is a uh, pathetic barbarity we have seen in these attacks, right? Now, the moment it happened, so I am not going to go into the uh, Israel's response 9th October or so. I mean, there are it is a nuanced perspective, people can hold different opinions whether Israel is you know right or wrong in being so uh, further. So, I am not going there. But I am talking about before Israel started anything. So, between 7th October and 9th October, there are celebrations in American universities. In one Ivy League university uh, in Cornell, I saw a professor saying, well, you see there is always violence against the minority, against this basically this uh, Arabs and now uh, Hamas you know killed so many people. So, they have actually done a counter violence and that leveled up the violence sphere. So, he is justifying murder of hundreds of people based on these theories. If you look at the global media, most of the media are often um, uh, go by this idea of majoritarianism. Actually, the idea they call it counter majoritarianism. So, basically because there is majoritarianism, they have to actually always uh, be biased against the majority in their news coverage. So, I have given in my book, I have given examples, uh, there is a Aklak from U, uh, Uttar Pradesh in 2015 or so, uh, he was killed uh, by a mob for uh, having beef in his house, uh, really pathetic incident uh, and it was got a lot of uh, traction in the global media. But around the same time, 
is a, uh, another Hindu youth, his name is Prasant Pujari in Karnataka, I think. He was also killed. And uh, for pow, his activism against cow slaughter. Again, another religious intolerance, right? But if you look at the global media, Aklak's indigenous has like almost like 13, 14 times more reports in global media compared to the um, Prasant Pujari's case. And that's one aspect. And second aspect is the headlines of Aklas was India going to be Nazi Germany and all this kind of things, just for one incident. Eh? And in case of Prasant Pujari, it is almost blamed on the Prasant itself. Well, this guy was doing some cow activism. I mean, you know, it's bound to happen, sort of. I mean, they have not said bound to happen, but the tone was like that. So then, uh, this is this is the idea of the majoritarianism, right? I mean, in their idea. So, because the majority is dominating in their coverage, they have to do in the other way around, right? There is nothing personal about it for them. For them, this is the basic state of the affairs of the society, and they are doing the good thing to promote harmony, and that's why they have to always highlight so any atrocity uh, committed on the minority by the majority, and always uh, put it you know any atrocity done by the minority on the majority, they have to put it under the carpet. So that is kind of the idea. So they are doing it with good intention. I am not blaming them for any mal intention. They are doing it with good intention. But that is the idea. And if you look at even the, this is one incident I talked about, there are big incidents, right. For example, we know uh, there is a big uh, attack on the Kashmiri Pandits uh, in the 1990 or so and um, many hundreds died and basically more than one lakh people at least uh, they migrated out of the valley right and so then then basically all these people then if you look at the global media their mentions are there but not too high 15 16 times more mentions are there about the gujarat violence in 2002 now gujarat violence 2002 was more nuanced no kashmiri pandit killed any kashmiri muslim but in Gujarat violence, well, it's possible. The, the official record wise, more Muslims definitely died. But also, there are hundreds of Hindus, they also died. So, it was not really as one sided as the Kashmiri uh, Pandit uh, um, genocide, right? But still, it is, if you look at the case, it is uh, not mentioned so much, mentioned much, much way, way low, right? And then, secondly, Kashmiri Pandits actually migrated out because they could not sustain. But if you look at Gujarat, that is not the case. Basically, a Muslim uh, proportion in the uh, in the population it has actually gone up after that uh, 2000 between 2001 and 2011 it has gone up in the according to the census. Uh, there is actually one person I know Kutubuddin he came to Kolkata because he uh, felt that time he was the icon right and he kind of felt miserable. But then eventually after one year or two he actually went back again to Gujarat and started his business there. I saw recently saw his interview he says he is all right there. So, the point I am trying to say that this is, this is the idea of majoritarianism and it is practiced in media. But sometimes I wonder why is this idea of majoritarianism is only applied on India and Hindus. I do not hear these kind of uh, arguments coming for uh, things happening in Bangladesh or Pakistan. Are their intentions really <laughs> pure? Uh, as an academician, I like to believe that uh, the other party has always good intentions. I mean, if you attribute mal intention to any one, so this then that is not a fair argument. So, for example, if you look at the Hindutva, whatever uh, arguments against Hindutva is always based on some potential mal arguments, right? Well, Hindus, though, you know, someday they will kind of uh, start the genocide of the Muslims and that is why they are bad. So, it is not basically the uh, it is not a fair argument I think and I will not even for my opponents also uh, the liberals I will not tell them mal malevolent or anything like that I will just to take them as the right value and that is how I have done that in the throughout the book. I never have considered them that they are having any mal intention or anything like that. Uh, now yeah now other part you mentioned is about the global media that is very interesting. So, I have done a survey for 3 years 2020, 21, 22 from a global uh, uh, new stream database and there I have actually got like around approximately 8800 mentions of majoritarianism. So, it consists of not only newspapers, but also uh, prominent uh, theses and uh, many other prominent citations, but this is the discourse in the civilized society, right? It is a global and out of one fifth of the cases, four fifth of the cases, it is a majoritarianism has been used as a concept without 
particularly pointing the finger at a community at least not apparent from the from the reading one fifth of the cases there is actually a majority that was actually implied and i actually see what is that majority and you are right 80 percent of the cases it is the hindus at least 80 percent of the cases it is the hindus of india now of course uh, global population wise hindus i don't know 15 percent or something so it's hard to believe me that they are responsible for 80 percent of these all these things um, but that's what the media is uh, i have actually called it a hindu uh, majoritarian hindu paradox and i have resolved it in my book also uh, I'll not. I'll not. I'll hold some suspense here. I mean, I would like the readers to read my book and get why this paradox happens. Um, not coming from the book, but is this coming from that uh, old uh, philosophy of Western world of white supremacy, and they see only India as a threat or the Indians as a threat as they are currently rising financially, even in Europe, even in America. So, is this, this could be a reason, I may sound like a conspiracy theorist, but that's what I, I feel at least. I will not ask you to comment on that. I will come to my next question. Okay. No, but I will comment something. Okay, sure. So, first uh, pointed fingers are at Hindus. Second pointed fingers are the Singhalis, Buddhist, Singhali Buddhists. Third pointed fingers are the whites actually, uh, whites of America. Um, so, uh, of course, I mean, I do not think in a way white racism is much of a problem as of now. So, there are other forms of racism that are bigger problems and other forms of theories that are bigger problems. So, my next question is if uh, that majoritarianism concept is the is not the root cause of uh, disharmony in Indian society, what alternate explanation do you offer for that? So, basically if you look at the one thing, if you look at any of the our traditions, Indian tradition and also it is also true in the other traditions of the world largely, the root cause of any disharmony does not lie outside us, it lies inside us right. If we have him, we call it in our tradition we call it himsha. If you have himsha for someone, it will manifest, you can't stop it, minority, majority, what difference does it make? If you have himsha, it will cause problems, that is what it is right. So, um, I call it, uh, I basically call it, uh, defined a term based on the sociological theories, I call it linear theory of social uh, evolution, LTSE. Uh, what is the linear theory of social evolution? So, many dogmas or doctrines, they give some kind of a theory, I will explain with an example. That theory says, basically the societal evolution happens in a linear way growing of it, that doc, doctrine and this is first part of the theory and second part those who do not believe in dogma they have to be otherized, they have to be uh, uh, sort of uh, made inferior, they need to be treated inferior for their disbelief. So, one example I would give, uh, so the be a seminal thing is started what I call political Christianity. So, if you look at political Christianity was the idea. Uh, I, I do not think political Christianity was started by Jesus, I, I think it is started by someone else. So, but anyway, church maybe. Uh, maybe Paul, maybe his church, I mean whoever it is, but the, but the idea is Jesus is the first Christian, then the Christians are growing, growing, growing and eventually everybody will be Christian, right? That is the linear theory. If you are not a Christian, then you are essentially no, something inferior, right? So, the idea was you will go to hell, this is the to create, so you will not go to hell based on your karma. You will go to hell because you disbelieve in this theory, that is very much it, right. Now, political Christianity, I say in my book itself, is not very active force in the West anymore. But in, if you look at the its offshoots, they are actually causing all the problems. If you look at this uh, other uh, uh, other LTSEs, they are actually causing all the disharmony. So, uh, if I have faced myself, so this Marxism, for example, right, it came in a Christian society, it is the same kind of a theory. Right? Marx is the first egalitarian kind of person who has given the scientific uh, dialectical materialism or whatever they call it uh, and it will grow over time, it will eventually conquer. Right? So, I grew up in Bengal and uh, I used to read science fictions in the, my childhood that say, well we are going there eventually we will uh, be in a communist globe where from North Pole to South Pole everybody will be communist, everybody will be equal, so good, so fantastic. Right? So, you see the linear theory? And those who are not doing, you know, succumbing to this theory, they are sort of bad person. So, my father, he was sort of like lapsed communist 
um, naturally this is a problem with any one lapsed once you become lapsed you sort of feel it's your moral duty to correct uh, your one's fellow mates so my father used to usually correct the communists well you are this is the thing you are saying there are some philosophical problems what you are saying is very mild it's a very philosophical way of saying things but he becomes an enemy why does he become an enemy i did not understand this that correctly because he is violating their idea of linear theory so from their theory they understand all the educated people they have to be marxist over time and my father being no no you know he is a police person and all these things he must be a marxist how come he be other way around from marxist to other way around so this is a problem he said disbeliever so this is the idea and this creates huge intolerance in society uh, that's what the my claim it's my hypothesis and i have actually tested it and in your book you have defined hinduism as non ltsc but political islam and political christianity as ltsc uh, though i do you have answered it uh, already in the previous answer but i would still want you to elaborate upon it a little bit why is there this asymmetry you see this category of religion that creates hinduism in the same bracket as islam or christianity it was not done by the hindus it was actually done by the christian missionaries in the 19th century so they came here and they see that there is something here people call it dharma and other things but these people are known hindus no hindu call that these are my beliefs this is my hinduism nobody call but they have to categorize that a religion therefore they can show it is inferior to christianity that is the project right and they again they are doing it all the best of the intention because they see christianity is the solution so these people have to be understood right they have to be they have to be made to understand that this is the uh, this is the right wrong path so how do you see this is the wrong path so because you will contrast it as a religion to christianity and show it's bad right and this is the reason they started it now that's why it is wrong for us to believe that uh, the hinduism is in the same bracket as the other religions and this is not my theory uh, there is a very uh, reputed scholar s n bal gangadhar he was actually in the ghent school uh, ghent university in belgium he was also the ch uh, ch chair of the american academy of religions and he has a very seminal hypothesis that hinduism is not a religion in fact no pagan doctrine is a religion that's what the idea is and uh, so that's why it is not comparable to the other things uh, and if you look at really the uh, data in the sense that before christianity uh, anything is to be called pagan right in the europe and if you look at these pagans all the pagan doctrines they nobody had a linear theory and this is not i am saying this is yuval noah harari is saying in his bull sapiens he is saying this if you look at the greek historians if you look at the chinese historians they all believe in a some kind of a cyclicality right in hinduism we also say sometimes dharma will rise then adharma will rise again dharma will rise right we have this chatur yuga satya teta dapar kali and then again satya and teta and dharma so this is a cyclicality it is not if you look at the hindu rituals again there is a puja for dharma there is a puja for adharma there is a puja for lakshmi there is a puja for alakshmi there is a puja for um, vidya there is a puja for avidya so we believe that world is not a linear place it is made of both sometimes this will rise sometimes that will rise and we kind of uh, worship the nature from that point of view right but if you look at this christianity it actually started this linear theory as in the sense of a faith so kaushik ji question is mm. what evidence or scientific tests support your assertion that majoritarianism is an unscientific concept also could you explain how you have integrated interdisciplinary research into your work to challenge this prevailing academic paradigm and how is how does your explanation offer a better point of view okay that's very nice so if you look at the majoritarianism people I mean those who believe in majoritarianism it's a hypothesis for them it's a theory for them they don't offer any evidence so i am a i'm a student of science originally yeah so i actually cracked iit some point in time so i have a lot of respect for science so i have i actually wanted to see that i don't take any theory as a face value it has to be sort of contrasted with the other possible alternatives and see how it is so i gave this idea of ltsc not from actually economics it's a lot of study on psychology if you look at this book uh, victor frankel 
Uh, this uh, this book is called Man's Search for Meaning. Meaning, uh, right? After uh, concentration. World War II concentration. Concentration yeah. camp, right? It's a very famous book. I mean, everybody should read the book, I think. But so there he mentions one incident. What happens? One of his co inmate you know, in these prison camps, lots of rumors going around. So there's a date. I forgot the date, but that time, supposedly by that date, the army is supposed to come and liberate this concentration camp, right? And this did not happen. And his inmate, he really believed in it. The moment did not happen, he was otherwise healthy. He but he suddenly perished, right? He got some disease and, you know, one or two days he died. This shows, in our psychology, we take theories sometimes very, very seriously. And that becomes our reality, right? This is like, you can say, alternative reality, parabastab. There are different ways to say that. Now, this LTAC, so this idea, this is how the idea of my LTAC. Right? This creates a psychologically a theory. It's an extreme example I gave from Viktor Frankl, but roughly it happens because this theory is your existence, Marxism your existence, right? So anything contrary to that is sort of like wrong, right? Sort of like not a reality. Now this is psychology literature. Then I also uh, studied a lot of the uh, themes studied in the psychology literature, how basically uh, people actually lie, uh, people actually lie for their end purpose. And this is called, this, there is a name for that, it's called the uh, dark triad. So basically there are three things, it's called narcissism, uh, Machiavellism, um, the other name is not coming to my mind. Uh, so this is, these three things together, they call it, uh, emotions, they call it dark triad. And then they basically, this actually manipulate, this uh, makes people manipulate others and tells lies. And I have given a lot of examples how this acts and all these things. So I have actually integrated psychology, economics and political science in all these things in this thing. So what I have done, I look at the basically first very extreme events of intolerance, these genocides, right? There are many, many genocides. I look at the top 10 of them that is discussed in Western media, right? I did not choose my tale of the genocides. And what do we see? We see that almost all the genocides, except one, which happened in Rwanda in 1994, most people were almost unaware, not participated, not, they did not participate in the genocide at all. I take one example. If you look at this, uh, this is very close to my heart. So it is this Bengali genocide in 1971 by the Pakistani army, right? So this Sam Maneksha movie, right? It has also shown to an ex extent. Uh, Sam Bahadur. Uh, now, there what happened? Basically, there are almost 1 to 2 lakh of Pakistani troops. They came to Bangladesh and they do extreme brutality. Right? They killed almost 3 million people, 80 percent probably Hindus. And uh, women was gang raped. It's very sad tale. Uh, but if you look at the idea, can you really blame the Pakistani people for that? I, the answer is unfortunately no. Pakistani people, they did not consent that do the genocide. They never said that, right? It is the army who followed the orders. But one thing is definitely apparent and you can go through these uh, memoirs of the generals there. They have this idea of LTSC. So they actually said that, well, this is the idea of the, you know, political Islam on which Pakistan is born and these Bengali people, they are not actually doing their best in the interest of this political Islam. So, they have to be taught a lesson. So, LTSC example is there everywhere, but there is no example of the majority being involved. If you look at the Nazi genocides, most Germans were not involved. The German army was also not involved. It is mostly the SS guards, right? Basically, uh, the people, the third rate criminals, right? Basically, Hitler made this group. And they are only capable of this genocide. Even they, they used to be get depressed when they used to kill people. So, it is a, so the, all these genocides it did not happen because the majority kind of chased the minority, not like that. In the Rwanda case, 10 percent people were involved. That is the estimate say. I cannot say this is not the majority or this is a, a majority. I do not know exactly way. So, I wrote maybe as the conclusion, maybe majority was involved, I do not know. But the other cases, there is no way you can implicate the majority. But in all these cases, there is a LTSC that you can see. This is the big events. Now, if you go to the small events, and I have a framework, and I have shown, then basically in the economics framework, it is a framework based on Hayek, a very celebrated economist, Nobel laureate of course, 
and in this framework basically we understand that if there is a lot of persecution against a community that community will slowly go away. So, the population proportion wise that community will kind of go down right and uh, there is a case when you can see whether majoritarian hypothesis is uh, different than the LTSE and that case is when the minority has an LTSE, but the majority does not right majority may not then basically uh, the majoritarian hypothesis wise the minority proportion should go down, but if you look at the our my LTSE hypothesis the majority population should go down and one test bed is where we live in India and we have seen in India basically the Hindu population is steadily falling. Um, from the independence onwards, but in this in the exceptional case only case uh, being interpreted to my convenience. Well, no, there are other cases. Look at Nepal, same thing is happening. Look at Lebanon, same thing happened. They are again uh, the Christians, they are orthodox, did not have really an LTSE and then uh, the other people were Arabs, nationalists and socialists, they had one and the kind of happened the way they wanted. And if you look at uh, the other case the, like Tibet same thing same story is true right. So, basically the majority Tibetans they are going down. Even the era of Islamic invasion we can I think. Uh, so, I did not go that far again <laughs> because the idea of the majoritarianism actually holds where basically the uh, people can vote there is a sense of democracy and majority can actively take part in yeah, politics. Yeah. Hmm. So, I have given a very very objective way of looking at I did not go by my perception. So, again given your background in science and economics, sir what prompted your interest in researching and writing about this social issue and which would uh, I think fall under domain of sociology? Uh, it can fall under sociology uh, definitely, but it will also fall under political science right. and I have used economic theories, uh, so could fall under <laughs> economics, but the idea is basically. Uh, I used to be a very very passionate thinker and this is the one reason I am a statistician actually. I did my masters and bachelors uh, bachelors and masters in statistics, but I switched to economics because I was very very keen on the social issues. And uh, mostly uh, when I was young I saw the economics kind of determines the society I mean this is of course uh, not entirely true, but this is also true to a large extent also. Um, but then if you look at this uh, social theories, their idea of the reality is not what I see around me, right. I mean that is what I felt and if you go back to the history of science, if you go back to history of science I think the most important figure of science is Galileo. Before Galileo there is the Aristotelian theory, what is the Aristotelian theory? So, you take two balls 100 pound, one 1 pound, you drop them. The 100 pound ball will fall 100 times faster than the 1 pound thing, right. When someone told me this in childhood, this is the theory, I said, Yeah, this must be the case, this is heavier ball, this should go faster, right. And uh, there is no wonder that this theory was the most dominant theory for one and half millennia right Aristotle was 1500 more than that even I go than Galileo right. Sometime BC. Sometime BC right. So, basically uh, uh, this is sort of the most dominant theory right. Now, question is why then this theory linger so much because Europe sort of fell into a dark age and they lost the scientific consciousness. Science is not about theory, science is about reality. If the reality does not ma match you have to throw your theories away that is what the science is and that is what the Galileo did. He threw both the, the balls from the leaning tower of Pisa right and he showed that ball almost fell simultaneously right. So, this is the idea right the, this reality has to be explained by the theory not theory has to be constructed to sort of you know move around the way from the reality. And this is what I perplex me and that is why I thought that there must be something seminally wrong with the social sciences. Now, problem is if you are really sociologist, if you do not really uh, believe in this uh, or political scientists who do not believe in these dominant theories, uh, it is not easy to survive the discipline. Um, I am an economist, I do empirical work, I could survive, but I took it as a second job 
to study this as why this they are differing. So, I did not really curse the opponent, I really do not take them uh, wrong or something, I take them in the good intention and this is the, exactly my point of the entire book. Uh, I never dispute the good intention, I already uh, uh, say that they are good intention people. So, I studied the theories, what came out is their theories actually lack this idea of scientific testing and the idea of the reality there are alternative ways of the reality let us test the different ways. So, that culture is sort of missing um, I would say this is missing because liberalism is sort of like religion uh, well not sort of it is actually modern religion according to Yuval Noah Harari he wrote again in sapiens liberalism, Nazism or uh, communism these are modern religions they impose their whims and if you do not agree you are cancelled. So, this is the only way someone from as an outsider I could do this research because the insiders they may not be able to survive before doing this kind of research. In your book somewhere you also mention challenges in engaging and dissenting the perspectives with in academia. So, how would you respond to the potential backlash that would come from the academic institution who have been st studying this in their humanities department from very long time now. Yeah, so I see in a way, so one thing I will always appreciate, if my opponents they read the book and they wrote you know why I am wrong, I will appreciate that whether I believe whether I agree or not, because at the end of the day they are trying to engage, they are trying to um, work with me, but what happens? I read this, sent this, I wrote the mail I, when I got this link for this book in Amazon. I sent to all everybody, I mean my left hand liberal friends also. Um, I sent them, they, you know. So, some of them, okay, I have to give it to that, what is due. Some of them actually did engage and possibly they are going to read it. Um, they are some of them saying they are reading it. But there are others who said, well, we do not read trash. So, this person has not read anything about the book, just saw the image or title of the book and he is saying I will not read it. This is heresy, right? This is blasphemy. You what you are writing is heresy, blasphemy, I will not read it. Uh, so, backlashes could come or something like that may or may not come, uh, but what I feel that the right thing has to be done. Uh, in some sense, we academicians, uh, we should not just seek a career. The society is giving us money to study knowledge. That means, we should actually actively discard the pseudo knowledge, we actively should actually promote knowledge and we sh should promote harmony and peace in society. Now, these theories are the biggest obstacles to that, that is what I am trying to argue that. So, that is why I thought it is my duty. I might have to, uh, I might have taken some personal uh, life, might have got some uh, somewhere, it did not, uh, uh, you know, it did not prosper exactly how my colleagues or other people they have kind of prospered their life, but that is ok. And if the blacklist comes, that is also ok. I think I have to do whatever is done by the theory. Of course, I have, I, I, am, I know pretty one thing, if you look at from Galileo to Ayan Hershey Ali, they have been, they have suffered much more, way, way more than I would ever suffer for saying this. So, I am ok, I am happy with that. I will not say I am a victim or anything like that. I have got an opportunity for truth, I am trying to spread the truth. Great, that is a great thought indeed, I think more of our academicians should learn that. So, uh, next question that I have for you is, can you explain the concept of cultural Marxism as you discuss it in your book and how it relates to the origin and evolution of liberalism? It is a very interesting question. Um, Basically, cultural Marxism is, is, is now has become a conspiracy theory. If you go to Wikipedia, there is an entry cultural conspiracy theory of cultural Marxism, but it was actually in Wikipedia 2014 and then the liberals they got more and more dominant and they have cancelled this idea. But very, very interestingly, this is an old idea. In 1977 or so, one Polish uh, philosopher, uh, historian, his name is Leszek Kolakowski. He actually very famous person, he got many awards. He published a book, The Main Currents of Marxism, Oxford University Press, three volumes. And there he discussed 
how Marxism, the originally it is a kind of, you know, as we know, it's a class struggle between the haves and have nots based on economics. And then it was put in the cultural sphere by Gramsci, uh, a young uh, Italian communist, Antonio Gramsci. And Frankfurt School, a group of communist, um, a, a group of, I would say, leftist uh, uh, academicians. And they actually developed all the theories. Now, what happens uh, these theories? So, basically, if you want it in detail, little more, more detail. So, there is some one book is published already by Rajiv Malhotraji, uh, the snakes in the Ganga. He has given some details. Uh, but basically, Antonio Gramsci he wrote a lot while he was when he was in prison in Italy. Uh, it's called prison notebooks. Uh, at least that prison had um, notebooks to write. I mean, Savarkarji, when he was in Andaman, he could not have the notebooks, of course. But uh, anyways, those notebooks, they actually delineate a lot of his thoughts. Now, these thoughts have these elements and also the Frankfurt School is also there. Now, what happened? The Germany, you know, the Nazis, they came to power. Now, most of the proponents of these theories were Jews. And when Hitler uh, did his anti-Semitism campaign, so these people, they had to leave. And some of them, because they are brilliant, they got refused in the prominent universities in America, right? So Harvard, for example, it got this Harvard. It got this person called Harvard Marcuse. Harvard Marcuse was one uh, uh, disciple or one kind of uh, person very closely associated with the founders of the Frankfurt School, Harvard uh, Kuchenheimer. So basically, he then uh, came to Harvard and he started the various various doctrines, and they are called. They actually call themselves liberalism because uh, it is sort of to contrast them against the communism, which is, is to be called totalitarian. So they call we are not, uh, you know, we are not uh, totalitarian. We are liberals, uh, and that's how they, the idea of left liberalism, as we know today, it started that time. Um, so the theory is the, so there is a remarkable scholar whose name is James Lindsay. James Lindsay is a mathematician, but he's a PhD in mathematics. But he wanted to study this and he did many manual jobs and everything to survive. Again, I told you uh, it cannot be done by the insiders now. And he has done amazing work. How you can trace each theory of the present day liberalism to Marxism or to cultural Marxism. So he has a website, New Discourses. It's a, he has a YouTube channel also, New Discourses. And he has also a website, New Discourses, where he has a, a dictionary of each left liberal term. And each term, he has shown how it coming from that theory. So I think, so I, so I have worked only in the Indian context, uh, in the context of developing a social sciences based on Indian experience. Uh, he has done his work to trace cultural Marxism. We are, I think, almost same age. Uh, so I think I will refer people to go to James Lindsay's work and see how it, it kind of spans out. It is not there in my book, but you can see it. <laughs> But uh, to my understanding, even calling them social theories is wrong in certain way because they were later on purely developed as political theories to capture power or to grab power. Is it correct or uh, my understanding Again, is wrong? The idea of the good intention. When you say theory, we attribute the good intention to them. They are trying to explain the word in their capability, right? And why people do certain things, we are not sure, right? Am I giving this interview just for the sake of truth? I will say so. But my opponents can say, well, this guy wants to do something else to his ulterior motive. Now, if you, in, you know, you can give, give malevolence to anyone. So, I will not give malevolence to my opponents. I will just give their good intention. Because I want a dialogue between different parts of the different thoughts, processes and different spectrums. See, this process of dialogue has been cancelled, sort of, by liberals. But I don't want to do that. So I'll just so a part of the dialogue happens when you say, okay, you are also good intention, I'm also good intention. Now let's see arguments. Let's place each other, right? That's the Indian tradition. We used to have this uh, idea of the public debate. First, there's a Purva Paksha. You describe the other side. Then you present your side, Uttar Paksha. I'm just doing the same part. But is it fair to call them social theories? Theories need not be proven, right? So, if you look at the theory of evolution, of course, there is a lot of support for that and everything. Uh, but it is at, at the end of the day, it is a theory, right? I mean, uh, you agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, my next question is from that only. What specific principle or values do you prescribe for achieving social harmonies? And how do they differ from these Western social theories like liberalism 
और डी ई आई नोन एज डाइवर्सिटी इक्विटी एंड इंक्लूसिविटी वेरी नाइस क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली सो माई प्रेस्क्रिप्शन इज सत्य एंड अहिंसा नाउ दिस इज द लाइफ आवर ओल्ड एज ओल्ड फिलोसॉफी इज सत्य एंड अहिंसा इन महाभारत सो देयर इज बेसिकली द एंटायर आइडिया ऑफ द एपिक of the story of the history whatever you call it mahabharata is based on a contrast of different values and the base values it is says is satya and ahimsa and among that if you have to prefer one it is ahimsa now this is the, these values were passed down through the ages when buddha came he has said the same thing the buddha said pragya and karuna which is the another way of saying satya and ahimsa then if you go down the line mahatma gandhi ji i mean i know people have a very uh, nuance when people have a very uh, sometimes negative opinion of gandhi ji's politics i have also nuanced view of that but i would say that he was a great teacher the things he said as a teacher was kind of is good what he tried to do he did not try to make india another america or another britain that's the beauty of uh, gandhi ji's teaching he said that our teaching has to be founded on our own cultural understanding and this is why he put his idea of satya and ahimsa now problem which a little bit to his idea is a lot of the times gandhi ji's ahimsa was not based on our own experience it is based on uh, basically he has his understanding from russo and other people from western russian christianity and other things but the ideas were correct i mean satya and ahimsa uh, so then if you look at this idea these are experiential idea right should i speak to you the truth this is experience i have to agree to it now let's look at my liberal friends they have this idea of equity they have idea of diversity right they have the idea extremely they like equality right is it experiential so the idea actually it is not if i talk to my liberal friends some of them they go to foreign right every uh, every year they make a foreign trip it's it's like sort of like their status symbol right they post the photos and everything like that so definitely they are having much more money than anyone else is possible then they sort of say well i believe in equality now it is possible i am gi- not giving again taking the well intention away from them it is possible they still believe in a equality in a very abstract sense which i call the theoretical idea but in their experience they are not going for equality had they then they should not take so many foreign trips and all these lavish lifestyle right they should come in a very small way now as soon as you have money it naturally is not possible if uh, you cannot be treated like somebody who is begging on the street begging on the street right you have the money uh, what is the right? so that equality idea that equality is gone but but this is the point of equality it is a very very theoretical idea those who say equality they do not really practice it no, no. but if you look at ahimsa and satya these are practicable things let's take me today if i do a very so suppose someone says that i practice equality i mean most of the people i mean if you are a vinoda bhave or something then maybe you are right but normal people this liberal friends who said we believe in equality they are just i don't think they are very serious about it it's a theoretical idea for them it's not a practice value but satya is a practice value i have to speak you the truth right so this value i have to more i i i am nobody is perfect i know i know myself i mean i i might be wrong in my own analysis but maybe i am speak 90% or more than that satya but still there is a scope for me to increase satya by 10% right i cannot do it immediately but i this is the this is the sadhana so this is the penance work upon that this work upon that right yeah. this is why the entire rituals our rituals they are based upon the idea is you have to imbibe the idea of satya and ahimsa right so even uh, uh, when a mosquito comes right many of us they will not hit it right they will just put it away right Uh, so this is uh, this is like a sadhana right this mosquito bit you but you don't kill him so this is your ahimsa so that moment you are practicing it you are doing something for it and it, it makes you a better human being it makes you understand the other's point of view it makes you understand how people work and that's how the harmony social harmony can happen it cannot happen by some slogans that's utterly ridiculous makes sense even uh those who preach uh, diversity and equality even they might not have that exact pathway where uh, how to practice it practice it right again yeah. actually it's uh, a confused confused word in fact those who say diversity and other thing they actually don't believe that some of the communities they say want to be uplifted they are not capable of doing that this is what we always reject in indic thinking 
धर्मा It's a tapasya, but it takes time, but it has a permanent effect, and this is exactly why Indian evil civilization survived after so many barbaric assaults because we try to practice them. So it is in us, and it stays with us over generations. It does not deplete so soon. So my next question: In your book, you equate ideologies like Nazism, communism, and liberalism with political Islam and political Christianity. I think you have answered this to some extent, but again, I would answer question, put this question specifically. Can you discuss the rationale behind this comparison between political Islam and political Christianity to these theories of Nazism and communism? Very interestingly, it is again, I am not the first person to say that. It is Yuval Noah Harari who wrote it same thing in his book Sapiens, chapter 12. He said this communism, fascism, Nazism, or liberalism, these are religions just like Islam or Christianity. He also equated maybe Buddhism or Hinduism in that league because he is a macro historian. He did not have, did not study this Indic thoughts that deeply. But the basic idea is he added. Now, of course, as you have said that Bala Ganga Jabalu, he said that this is not Hinduism is not a religion. Christian thinkers like Tom Holland, a very famous Christian writer, he wrote Hinduism is not a religion, Christianity is the first religion. And there is a new Hinduism hypothesis that is going around the circle now. Then they also say, well, there is no religion of these people they have. So, what I am saying is not controversial, it is actually a lot large part academic opinion only. So, in your book, you have very clearly differentiated between racism and casteism. For our viewers, can you shed some light upon that? Sure. I said, okay, racism is what is racism, what is casteism. This is very you have to understand. See, anything can be anything in abstract level. We have to see how it is mean. So, when you say racism, when you look at this America, right, both the Americas is full of red Indians and these whites, they took it over, right. Uh, there is a big genocide that happened there, I described it well. But the idea was the land was be belonged to the only the other people, the whites took it over that time. And the idea was to take it over. So basically, it is a linear theory. It is displacing the other races. So it's the theory is whites will grow, grow, grow because they have superior gene or whatever it is. The other races will go down. If you look at casteism, what is it? The Brahmins, do they say that we will grow and grow and the Sudras will vanish and vanish? It, I mean, maybe one or two people might be there, by Godhead people, but largely uh, the casteists I meet they say we are superior. That is not a very, that is basically everyone's statement. Everyone says I am the best. The problem, it becomes problematic when people say I am the best and if you do not agree, I will treat you badly. Others should not exist. Others should not exist and they should, I will kind of, they will put it in inferior status and eventually go down. But that is what I do not see. In the casteist, if they are, then of course they are also as bad as the racist. I don't have a problem, I mean, doubt about it. But generally, the casteist they say that, well, we are kind of better, you know, that suppose uh, I am come from a, uh, a musician caste, right? There's a Gandharva communities, right? And then I say that, yeah, I am a better musician because my fathers, grandfathers, they are all musicians and I do better music. Now, you might dispute it, but the problem is they does not show any idea of displacing others. And the, if that does not happen, then you cannot say it a linear theory in the term of the book. It is possible that it is a, there is a certain sense that having I am the best is not a good thing. In, actually, in our uh, thinking, civilizational thinking, we call ego, aham, as the problem of everything. But it also acknowledges that aham will be there in everyone. Uh, you cannot really take it away, vanish it away. That is not it. You have to go through it. You have to go through a process, sadhana, tapasya, to make the you know, aham go away. It does not happen automatically. Um, so, that is what I would also say. So, of course, uh, we know that it may not be the right thing on all these things, but it will not suddenly go away because you say something. So, what happens many, many times there is a casteism, you try to vanish it, it reappears in another form. So, I give you an example in China, for example. China, there is an agrarian society and there are castes like us. So, uh, 
there is a uh, good article uh, I think Aurobindo Nilakandan he did it in Sarajjo on the caste system in China. And then basically this communists came and then under Mao and they took over. Again they created again a caste system. So basically party loyalists one class, the dissident hostile another class, in the middle there are some categories. In North Korea communist society there are 52 castes are there and they are kind of ranked also. So I am saying that uh, this is there in this uh, book. Uh, by the girl with seven names, uh, he's uh, basically a, a North Korean um, girl who got out of the country and kind of uh, traveled in China and then eventually settled in South Korea. So this book is there; you can look it up. So I'm trying to say that that the moment you just uh, you know say equality and everything, it doesn't happen automatically. It takes a lot of uh, sadhana and tapasya, and that's what we say that we have to clear may make ourselves better. And it is also idea of time in some sense. Sometimes. It requires a lot of diversification in different different professions and then maybe professions can arise and sometimes it requires more uniformity then maybe the caste system will go away. But it is not a uh, it is not a basically a, a system like racism where other people will go, will be removed or something like that. But uh, in other interviews with I have had uh, with our few of other speakers they clearly try to demarcate that casteism is an external term which has been superimposed like many things by colonials on us and our system was entirely different that was Jati Varna Kula system. So uh, isn't it uh, again a colonial giving that uh, they tried to put casteism just like racism that uh, the way things that they did to American and African society, Native American African society the way they enslaved them, enslaved them, they superimposed this theory on the on Indians uh, through casteism. So, Isn't so that again a no, that is to an extent what you are saying makes a lot of sense because originally the idea of the caste started in the Spanish colonies hmm. in Portuguese the South America. Like no, no, it is mostly in the Spanish word. In India, it, in India it came through Portuguese, but ah, right. it is actually a Spanish word. Okay. Uh, also, it is Portuguese also, but later day. Uh, but they basically they actually uh, uh, they used to practice something called miscegenation. So basically, uh, uh, so whites are one class. Then whites and these, uh, then these whites who are marrying the red Indians, so, so they are another class and this kind of categories and privileges like that. So that part is given. But then when it came to us and our Jati system, which is basically an autonomy of the different different social groups, uh, they tried to impose on us. Now I agree on one hand it is a colonialism, but also it is another hand. It's a it is a reality that society cannot be homogeneous in India. Society was actually a composed of different heterogeneous elements and they are living in harmony. There is no problem with different Jatis before the Europeans came actually before this census happened uh, between 1871 and 2001 where the castes were kind of given different different legal privilege. So there is a book by Nicholas Darks uh, is called uh, Castes of Mind. And where he actually said a lot of things how uh, the census rigidified the caste, it was a local phenomenon, it became a more pan Indian phenomenon and big large caste evolved and they consolidated their power and it became imaginary communities in some sense. Uh, so there is a lot of, there is no simple narrative of the caste uh, and the point that the caste will go away just because we are saying that is again a very shallow kind of opinion. So if you look at my colleagues. They may come from different different castes. They are all professors. Now, will their children will they drive auto rickshaws? I don't think that's not going to happen. Almost all the cases, right? Will they marry the people of the drivers? I mean, you know, will their children will they marry really the you know children of the drivers? That's not going to happen in the most of the cases. So when we say really we are not caste, we actually. Uh, do not take it very seriously, right? See, we have a, some idea of the class and other issues. Um, so, it is a complex idea, and uh, of course, a uh, caste system, uh, I mean, Jati Vavastha, that we used to call it, was probably not as rigid as it is imagined in the times. They were living in harmony, I think that is the, the idea was their autonomy. Huh? So, you see, in human society, you will never have perfect harmony. We will always have some conflicts, right? We are actually at secular conflict. Suppose this Jati's interest is actually pervading other Jati, so there will be some conflict or something like that. But there is no persistent linear theory like conflict. 
in Indian kind of thinking. That's what kind of I would like to say. So that brings me to the last question that I have, Kaushik Ji, for you. Uh, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? And how do you envision it contributing to ongoing discussions about social harmony and uh, further academic discourse? So the first thing is the readers, they have to understand one thing. If it is a monarchy, the monarch needs to know about everything. If it is a democracy, every citizen needs to know what we are doing. Some people parroting the slogans of equality and uh, harmony, justice and whatever it is, doesn't mean they are really doing it. Their theories may be doing the exactly oppo other way around. The slogans might be a diversion to their ultimate, uh, uh, ultimate sort of uh, agenda, reality where the agenda will be taking it away. Right? So, that is why my readers, I want them to understand the implications. Right? People actually, if you look at the politics, politics is a lot of run from these theories, these academic theories, they create kind of political parties and these political parties, they run election. So, unless you uh, judge them, you will be failure as a voter. I mean, we are saying that everybody should vote, but everybody should be knowing whom they are voting for, what they are voting for, right? That is one thing, of course, as a political theory, book on political theory, I would like to say that that thing. Secondly, what we, I want also want them to understand that the social sciences that are taught, this is a case study I have given them, very, very uh, highlighted it, but a lot of them are based on this kind of unscientific theories. And we need to reform this, um, this social sciences, so that these social sciences will enrich people in their lives. They will contribute positively to be developing real harmony between different people, different communities. That is what we have to ensure. And that cannot happen unless there is a popular opinion for that. So, my book is uh, dedicated towards that only. Thank you Kaushik sir for this wonderful session. I am sure all our viewers have learned a lot and thank you everyone for watching this. You will find the link for the book in the description and uh, this book is available on Amazon and it has been published by Garuda Prakashan and the book's name again I will reiterate it is The Majoritarian Myth How Unscientific Social Theories Create Disharmony. It's a very interesting and fresh take and I am sure all of you will enjoy it. Thank you.